<clears throat> title of the sermon today is What's Going On? Just before I do that, after church, those of you who didn't get a, a, a newsletter in the mail or in your email, there'll be some as you leave today. The deacons are going to be handing these out. I think we have enough, at least one for a family, and we'd love for you to have that newsletter that Pastor Audre and Esper worked on and, and I worked on it a little bit and Pastor Deirdre, was well, she's gone. She's in Atlanta, Georgia at a wedding this weekend and uh, we wish her well. And also uh, Esper help, helps with this and uh, Susan Camacho. So I hope you enjoy the newsletter. We hope you can know what's going on in our Arlington Church better and uh, make plans to be a part of the family here. As, as we consider the, what's going on in our world, it's quite sobering, and it, it always seems to get more sobering when it comes closer to your front door, or maybe your back door, but it, it gets a little more serious and a little more sobering. It seems like that it's spreading out all over the world with tentacles and with uh, danger in its, in its veins. And I want to look a little bit at the Word of God today. Now, something that really struck to my heart this week when I heard the reports or saw it on TV news was talking about how that people were, innocent people, were, their, li their lives were lost. And in a generic way, in a general way, these people were innocent. They, they, they weren't trying to kill anybody when they got killed. They probably weren't even thinking about killing anybody or stealing anything or doing anything terrible when they got killed. And they surely weren't in a war. They were unarmed and they were untrained as far as military goes. And they were under a vicious predatorial attack. And in that context, these dear people were innocent victims of a very ugly spirit that the Bible calls evil and Satan. But in the context of the Bible and of the human race and of the general condition that we are in, not one of us is innocent before God. And we are all guilty of predatorial violence and murder against the Lamb of God. Sin is a killer. And sin is what killed Jesus that day. And in Isaiah 53, it plainly says that the Father took all of our sins and laid them on Jesus. Very plainly, it says it very clearly. That he has laid upon him the sins of us all. Sin produces death. The wages of sin is death. Jesus did not deserve to die. But he did. He didn't come here to kill anybody. But he was murdered. By the entire human family. You and me. And it is so real that if Paul Lundgren, me, if I am the only sinner, if I'm the only human being that ever commits a sin, Jesus still has to die the way he did. Because my sin produces death. And if he doesn't take my death, then I must suffer my own death, eternal death. It's an amazing testimony from God. And as we look at these violent criminals, these, you know, until, until this week, I've been prone to call them Islamic terrorists or radical Islamists. And I've decided that it's bigger than that. They, they claim to be Islamists. And there's so many different kinds of Islam, people, of Muslims, there's as many different kinds of Muslims as there is Christians. And if you really want to educate yourself, you need to dig a little deeper and understand there's a lot of different Christians around people. There's some Baptist Christians in Florida that every time there's a military funeral, they go out and they protest 
and they scream at the people and they violate the, the sanctity of their burial at the cemetery and they call themselves Christians. They are not Christians. Now, I'm not an expert on what a Muslim is, but I know more than I did last week because it sent me digging a little more. Find out what in the world is going on with these people, 1.7 billion of them, who come under the label of Muslim. Just like 1.5 or 6 billion or more Christians come under the label of Christians, Catholics, Methodists, Presbyterians, uh, Jonestown, that was under the label of Christian. Jonestown in Guyana, in South America, where they all died because they drank poison because the pastor told them to drink poison and he claimed to be a Christian. Was that Christian? No. So I don't know what all's going on there. But I know it's evil. And I know this much. I have met, personally met, people who live under the banner of Muslim. And they're just as, if not more, decent than me. They're very polite. They're very kind. They do good things. They help people when they're hungry. They do all kinds of beautiful things. I know some Muslims like that. I play ping pong with some of them. One of the most beautiful persons I know. But the problem is, there's a setup that Satan can push a few buttons and if you don't have the right programming in your mind, you can go crazy no matter what kind of human being you are. That goes for Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, and yes, people who are living under the banner of Christian. They can go just as crazy and do just as ugly of a thing. If you don't believe that, go study the 1260 years of the Dark Ages. The church that was called Christian of that era, killed 50 million people. And they kept track of everybody they killed. And they killed these people because they were flying a different brand of Christianity. So these group of Christians killed these Christians for over 1,200 years, claiming to be Christians. And they kept track of it, and they have it in, the, in their in their in their vaults because they, they felt like they were doing God's will. They were doing a holy thing to kill these, these, these heretics, these non-conforming people who claimed to be Christians, but they were not following my brand of Christianity. Therefore, we killed them. And they kept track of it because they felt they were doing a great thing. 50 million. So we need to think about this a little bit. This is really true. All of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. And without the shield of Christ over my life, but for the grace of God, which that's what the shield of Christ is, the covering of God, but for the grace of God, I will go and do just as much of an ugly and crazy thing as anybody you've ever seen. And if you think your sinful nature is not that ugly, you do not understand who you're living with. My sinful nature murdered Jesus Christ. And until you own that, and until you understand how real this is, you will not be able to love the way Jesus loves. Your heart will be hardened. You will think that you are better than others. And you will condemn others because how could they be that ugly? Because you don't realize how needy and how helpless I am. We must come to grips with this. We must. The devil wants... Christians to hate Muslims. The devil wants people who live under the banner of Christian to rise up and have a, 
a whiplash reaction against all Muslims. The same way we did against all Japanese people in World War II. We rose up and we treated them like animals. We herded them into camps. And they were guilty without a trial. That happened here in America. And the devil rejoices when human beings commit such crimes against other people human beings. In the name of Jesus, claiming to be Christians, we make those mistakes. By God's grace, through the miracle-working gospel of Jesus, I pray that I will never get caught up into that kind of ignorance and insanity. Jesus, while my sins were murdering Jesus, he said, Father, forgive him because he doesn't know what he's doing. What a Savior. And that's the Savior. The same Savior that Stephen represented when Saul and his buddies were stoning him to death Stephen allowed the love of God, this river of life that Jesus said will come up out of your innermost being, he allowed this river of love, the river of life, to overflow. And instead of, instead of hating them and cursing them, he prayed the prayer that Jesus prayed that day on the cross. That's the kind of Christian I want to be. Amen. And with God's help, we can all be like Stephen. And even like the Apostle Paul. The, one of the greatest haters of Christ became one of the greatest ministers of Christ. And when they cut his head off, they beheaded him in Rome. Because he wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. And I... I This is so real. And it's so dangerous to play with these things. I firmly believe that before they cut his head off, he was singing some song of victory of love, of thanksgiving. Because he was a real singer. You know, you can, you, you can tell who the real singers are in the Bible. They beat him with rods that night in Philippi. Simply because he was talking about Jesus. Now the greatest enemies of the church in those days was the Jews. The Jewish people. And they got the Romans all stirred up against the Christians too. They beat him with rods. He's changed in a stinky, stale, full of... You talk about a, a prison that needed to be condemned because there was deadly mold in it. Can you imagine what those prisons were like down there? He's chained. He's been beaten and spit upon. And what does he do at midnight? He taps his, he couldn't tap him because he was chained, but he says, hey Silas, let's, let's, sing that du, let's sing that duet we've been practicing. And they started singing. <laughs> wow. I want to hear that song when I get to heaven. I want Paul and Silas up on the front. I want to hear that. Don't you want to hear that song? And it was so good. It was so over the top that God sent down, God and all the angels, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and all the angels, and the 24 elders, and they're there. They went back there with Jesus. From the earth, sinners from the earth are in heaven, 24 of them. Revelation 5, plain as day. 
That song was so good, they sent back such an incredible applause that the chains fell off. And the door swung open. Now, I call that a big amen from heaven. I want to get there. I want to hear Paul and Silas sing. How about you? Amen. Oh, we lost our video. Maybe they thought that was the only one I was going to use today. Maybe it is the only one I should use today. I don't know. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, it's a gift, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For by your words, Jesus said, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. On another occasion, Jesus said that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says, like a fountain, and a fountain that gives forth pure and good water is because of Deep down inside, it's pure and good. And one that gives out poison and toxin is because the, that old sinful nature is in charge. That's why it's so important, it's so vital, it's so urgent that you and I receive that new nature, that new heart that Jeremiah talks about, that Ezekiel talks about, that Isaiah talks about, that everybody in the Bible talks about. Even Nebuchadnezzar talks about it. He wrote part of the Bible, part of the book of Daniel. He even talks about it. It's so vital, it's so urgent that we get this new heart living water experience every morning. That we renew it each morning. Daily taking up the cross. Jesus said, if you don't take up this cross every day, you can't follow me. We must do it each day, renewing it. And once we find out how wonderful it is, and how powerful it is, and how, how vitally urgent it is, we will be happy that we're awake so that I get to go and talk to my king again this morning. I get to go and give my life to him again this morning. I'm going to do it officially, I'm going to do it formally, and I'm going to do it literally. And when I do it, he's going to know that I mean business. Amen. And I'm going to do it where nobody else is watching. I'm going to go to my closet. Or I'm going to go to the basement. Or I'm going to go to my car. Or I'm going to go to the barn. I'm going to go somewhere. It's going to just be me and God. And we're going to make this thing real. Because he told me to do it this way. I'm going to do it this way. He said, go to your closet. He said, when you pray in private, I will reward you in the open. And the greatest reward is that the life of Christ will come flowing out of your life. The greatest reward is to have Christ formed in us, the hope of glory, and to have that life bu bubbling over with wisdom. Hoo -hoo. How many of us need some wisdom? With joy, with kindness, with forgiveness, with mercy, with healing in our wings. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. The Father sent Jesus here and he had healing in his wings. If you have Jesus in your soul, you will have healing in your wings. He said it, not me. He said, if you believe in me, out of your innermost being shall come forth rivers of living water. Life-giving energy. This stuff is very real. And, and how do my words justify me? Well, we talked about it last Sabbath. If God asked me, Paul, why should I let you live forever with me in heaven? My words are, Jesus went to the cross for me. And I receive his victory on my behalf. That's it. Not because, well, I went to church my whole life. Well, I prayed every day. No, no, no. Jesus went to the cross for me. And his life ransomed my wretched life from the pits of death. That's why I get to live forever. Those words will justify you in the judgment. And I'm telling you, you, if you haven't recorded those words at the throne of the universe, you need to record them right now. Don't let another day go by. And record them every day. Take up your cross every day. 
Make sure all heaven knows what's inside of you. The faith of Jesus is inside of me. And that's the only way I can say what I just said. If I didn't have the faith of Jesus, I'd be saying, well, I'm as good as everybody else. I'm just as good as so-and-so. I, I mean, uh, I've been pretty good. I've, been, I've, I've done more good things than bad things, so I haven't killed anybody. Oh, God will let me into heaven. Not a chance. Not a chance. Every false religion in the world, and let me tell you something. Every religion that is not under the banner of Jesus Christ, our righteousness, is a false religion. Even if they call it Christian. And there's a lot of Christians who are teaching that nonsense. Wow, it sure is quiet in here. If you go around telling people if you're good enough, you can get into heaven. Or if you teach, if you die in the performance of doing the will of God, you'll go straight to heaven. That's called jihad. And jihad doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be killing someone when you die to get into heaven. It just means you have to be doing whatever God told you to do. As long as you're doing something, you get into heaven immediately. See, doing, that's works. And the gospel says, as long as you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you get in. Amen. We're going to look at this. I know we're running out of time, but we're going to get it. Here's what Paul said about the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. I use New King James Version, so now I have to look and read it. I memorized it in King James. How many of you guys have a problem with, you learned everything in King James, and now you've got to learn it all again? It gets kind of weird. For in the righteousness, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. In what? In the gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just, those who are justified, shall live by faith. In other words, they're going to grow, they're going to be alive, by faith. It's all faith. Faith produces good works, but guess how good my good works are? They're filthy rags. According to Isaiah, Isaiah 64 verse 6, says my best righteousness is filthy rags. So don't ever say works are included. You've got to have works. No, you don't. You have to have, you, you have, to have Jesus. His righteousness. And his works, when it's all said and done, my good works will not release me from my bad works. Can't happen. If I didn't sin one more time for the rest of my life, and say I lived 20 more years, and I didn't sin one more time for the rest of my life, I could not get in heaven based on my works. Won't happen. But every religion on earth, except for the pure gospel, teaches works. And it cannot save us. Only by faith. Here's how easy it is. And Peter preached this the first day he preached. The coward. The coward, Peter, who was hiding. The coward who said, I don't even know him. And he used swear words when they were trying Jesus in an illegal mock trial. They said, oh yeah, you're one of his. No, I don't even know this guy. He's a blankety blankety. Who knows what he said? Don't you know Jesus, or don't you know that Peter is thankful that it's easy to be saved? <laughs> how, do you, how do you counter denying Jesus? Telling people that he's just a, he, he's an illegitimate child. Who knows what he said that night? I don't know. I don't follow that guy. Don't you know he's illegitimate? They don't even know who his dad was. That was the common discussion for those who did not like Jesus. He can't be a prophet. Don't even know who his dad is. His mother was pregnant before they got married. It was an ugly place. And Peter was an ugly human being, just like you and me. Until Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gave him that new heart. And, and then he was able to say this. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord. And, he, and Peter said Yahweh that day, because that's what the Jews said. 
It took through the book of Acts a few years for them to discover that Jesus, even Peter, they, it took them a while to discover that Jesus was actually Yahweh in the flesh. They, Emmanuel, which being interpreted means what? Elohim, Emmanuel. The E-L at the end of that word is Elohim. That's in the, in, the, in the book of Genesis where it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. The word there for God is Elohim. It's not Allah. And it's not even Yahweh. It's Elohim. And Elohim is plural. Because there are three gods who become one God. There's God the Father. He, he's, he was somewhere, and Jesus was down here, God the Son, God the Word, and Jesus prayed to God the Father. So there's at least two. And then there's God the Holy Spirit. Jesus gets baptized. The Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit, the God, the Holy Spirit, came upon Jesus. And they are one. And it's true. And that one doctrine right there sets us apart from many, 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 many people. That's a whole other story. But it became known that Jesus was was Lord. And very soon Peter was preaching, call on the name of Jesus. And that's what got him in trouble. He began saying, be baptized in the name of Jesus. That got him in trouble. Jesus had said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, Peter got so excited when he found out Jesus was really fully God and he was Yahweh that he started saying, be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then he had to go back and and start doing it the way Jesus said to do it. And so I baptize people in the name, uh, uh, according to the resurrected Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Powerful testimony. But that's how easy it is. But you've got to call on Him to save you. To forgive you. To cleanse you. And to change you. Because a new heart is a big change. And if you don't think receiving Christ means something to do with changing, then I dare you to ask Jesus to come into your heart and then find out what kind of a battle you're going to have between your ugly nature and your new nature. It's going to get worse, not better. People think when they get baptized, oh, life's going to be peachy and creamy, and I'll have a bed of roses, and it's going to be fun. Are you kidding me? You're in for a real battle now. You've got a war going on inside your soul that you never even imagined, and you're going to struggle with it. And if you keep running to Jesus, you're going to win it. Amen? Here's what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Adonai, Adonai, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now I know for a fact, and, and you know, this is not a thing about we need to rise up and stomp out the Muslims. This is a thing about we need to rise up and lift up Jesus. That's what this is about. We're not here to stomp out anybody. Our, our battle is not against human beings. It's not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6, 10 and following. It's against demons of hell, is what, is what the Bible pl plainly says. And people calling themselves Christians will someday treat you exactly the way people who call themselves Muslims are treating everybody today. It will return. It will repeat. And if you, think it's, if you think Christians are under attack now by a, third of, uh, by a fifth of the world, a fifth of the human race, they say the Muslim religion is about a fifth. And I don't even believe all Muslims are after to kill Christians, but there's quite a few of them that think that they need to be killing Christians. And they've been crucifying them in Egypt and in Iraq. They've been crucifying quite a few of them. Once in a while, they burn them alive. Once in a while, they cut their heads off. This has been going on for quite a while, folks. 
But if you think having a fifth of the human race coming after you is bad, wait till we get into the time of trouble. It won't be a fifth anymore. It'll be more like seven-eighths. Because there'll be a little bitty group who won't bow to false religion. They won't bow to works religion. They'll just lift up Jesus. And they'll say Jesus is all we need. But the Muslim religion, religion does teach that Allah does not have a son. And this was in 630 AD. They said 600 years after Jesus was here, they said Allah does not have a son. It's beneath his dignity to have a son. And they said things like, it's in the Quran, they said Jesus did not die. It was probably Judas who died on the cross, and the apostles just twisted it. And Jesus, God just took Jesus to heaven like he did Elijah. Jesus never died. They teach some of these things, and, and they're in great darkness. But our prayers are greater, because our prayers are in great light. Because our prayers are in Jesus. And according to Romans 5, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. That's why we have prayer vigils and prayer meetings. And hopefully that's why you're praying every day in your house. But he says, they shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The will of the, the living God is that we believe on his Son, Jesus Christ. That's plainly stated. For God so loved the world. That whosoever believeth in his Son, Jesus Christ, should not perish, but have eternal life. The will of God is to believe in Jesus Christ, whom he sent. All the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Period. No additions. None of this, you can get to God through any religion, just keep trying. Forget it. You can't get to heaven by trying. You can only get to heaven by trusting. Period. Don't add any of this trying nonsense to it. It'll kill you forever. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful wonders in your name. Lord, you've got to let us in. Look at all we did. Look how good we were. That's religion of works. That's salvation by look what I did. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers, those who practice lawlessness. The word lawlessness, antonomous, you are against the law. You, you don't are not only against it, you promote being against it. You practice it. Isn't it strange that most of the religious world, most, a great vast majority of the religious world, either goes to sacred, what they call sacred worship services on Friday or Sunday, and they just blow Saturday away. Isn't that interesting? The one and only commandment that God specifically says, remember, these works religions say forget. Just forget. Let's go on Friday or let's go on Sunday. The Buddhists are even in on this. And there are, there are over a billion. This is an interesting situation we're in down here, folks. If you think we're just playing uh, Captain Kangaroo, it ain't, it ain't happening. Here's what Jesus continued to say. And this is, not just, this is not against Muslims. This is against any religion in the world that teaches works. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings, these words, these teachings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Now you want to tell me how you're going to perform the words of Jesus perfect, per, per, perfectly? You know how you do the word of God? 
you cast yourself on his mercy. And you say, Father, I, I see in the Bible what you're telling me I'm supposed to do. So, Lord, I'm just going to throw myself on you and trust you to do it for me. You're going to change me, God, because if you don't change me, I'm toast. I'm done. There's no hope. You're going to give me the power to do this, or it ain't going to happen because I don't have any power. And, and you need to be talking to him that way. He doesn't really need to hear it that much, but we need to be saying it so that we don't get caught up in how good we are and how better we are than somebody else. Some poor relative that never goes to church, chews tobacco, drinks booze, and, and cusses at the Oakland Raiders every time they beat the San Diego Chargers or something crazy like that. <laughs> you know, the more you look down your nose, it's just like Pinocchio. The more you look down your long nose, it gets longer and longer, and you get farther and farther away from the people you're supposed to be loving and helping. I will liken him to a wise man. He built his house on the rock, and the rain descended. The floods came. Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy comes in like a flood. He didn't say if the enemy. Isaiah saw this. He saw it coming. And in Isaiah 59, he says, when it comes, when the enemy comes in like a flood, Isaiah 59, 19, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. And the standard is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus. That's it. And it beat against his house, and it would not fall. If you want to still be standing at the end of the age, just stand on Jesus. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. If you build your life on any other teachings other than the teachings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Genesis through Revelation, if you build your life on anything other than those teachings, you will fall. And you will hurt everyone around you while you are falling. Jesus said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In Isaiah 4, and I hope you remember this, in Isaiah 4, it starts out, it says, In that day, whenever you see that day, you need to know we're talking about the end of time. And that day is not a 24-hour day. It's a 1,000-year period. Because the, the judgment and, and the wrath of God stretches over a 1,000 year period. And those who put their lives in Christ will be in heaven during that 1,000 years, at least most of that 1,000 years. I always wonder why uh, uh, Re Revelation 20 says uh, when it's almost a 1,000 years, well, some of it is going to start down here, which is kind of interesting. But most of it's going to be there. In Isaiah 4 it says, In that day there will be seven women. Seven false religions. Right now on the earth there are listed seven major world religions. Go look it up on the internet. Classified as seven major world religions. One of them is atheism. They have declared themselves a religion. And they're a big religion. Russia and China and a lot of Americans and a lot of other people in Europe are part of atheistic religion. There's a certain system of things you need to believe in order to be a good atheist. And they've declared them seven. It says seven women will say, let us take your name... But we will eat our own food and wear our own clothing. In other words, we're not going to eat your word. And we're not going to wear your garments of righteousness. But we want your name. We want to be known as those who worship God. And it's going to set up. And only those who are walking in Christ are going to see it for what it is. And it's going to be six, six, six. 
And it's erecting even now. While you and I sit here, the devil is busy building that kingdom. And it's coming. And then, one more verse and we close. In John 8, at the end of that chapter, it's a long chapter. At the end of the chapter, they said, who do you think you are, Jesus? These Pharisees and people. Who do you think you are? You know, we've got Abraham. And you're not even legitimate. They were casting bad reputation at Jesus. And this is what got him, this is what got him crucified. This is what got the Jews really riled up. They said, we have Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And I am is what he said at the burning bush to Moses. And because he claimed to be Yahweh, because he claimed to be the creator of the universe on earth in human form, they began to plot his murder from that moment on. They tried to kill him that day, but he slipped away. Because it was not his time. Then, oh I'm sorry, I added one verse last night and I forgot about it. Can you get that next slide for me guys? This thing's not working. I know it's up there. Don't you love technology? You see that little thing? That means it's not working. Uh Uh-oh. There there it is. See it? I love that little thing. It tells me that humans are imperfect. Anyway, if you can get it, that's fine. But we're going to go ahead and close. We close with the verse, John uh, John 7, 38. And it was this picture of this, this uh, waterfall coming over. And, and that's what it's like for the Christian. We, 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 we position ourselves before our God. And his life just pours over the, the threshold, the doors and thresholds of heaven. His life just pours over. It's constantly pouring out upon us. He pours into us. And then we overflow. And it's so easy. It's so easy. All we have to do is get before God and say, here am I. Do with me what you will as the potter with the clay. That's how easy it is. He will change you. He will make you the most beautiful person you've ever known. Because you'll begin to see more and more of Jesus shining out of your life. And you won't, take, you won't take any credit for it. You'll know it's because he's there doing it. And when people say, oh, you do such a good job. No, 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 no. What I do is B.C. What you're seeing is A.D. What I did was before Christ. What you're seeing is with Jesus. Isn't that right, Art? So how many of you want Jesus to be your wisdom and your peace and your righteousness and your your love, and, and, and to be able to pray the way Jesus prayed. So we'd be, be protected from all this hate and anger that the devil's trying to vent and stir up against human beings. As we close, I just invite anybody here today, if you came in here today, And you know that you don't fully belong to Jesus. You know you kind of halfway do or 75% or 90%. Yeah, most of the time. But you know you you haven't really been doing it fully. Including him on every detail of your life. I'm going to ask you to do it right now as we close. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. If you want to after church, you're welcome to come. I'd love to pray for you, with you after. But please do it before you leave today. We're under attack. The enemy is trying to turn us into haters and despisers. 
and those that wish evil upon human beings. We wish the military would go blow them up or something. Or I wish God would open up the earth and swallow them or something. And you know, that's his business. But my business is to let the Holy Spirit produce the words and works of Jesus in me. And a big part of that is pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who curse you. And do good to those who despitefully use you. I'd say that's a pretty good description uh, of what's going on now against Christians. And Jesus is the perfect description of how we are to respond. Let's stand together and let's sing, Thank You, Lord, for Saving My Soul as we close. I, we've been singing that. Maybe you know it by now. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. This is a faith song. This is a song that says, I believe you're doing this. I believe that you're making me whole every day. Okay? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. May the Lord be with you and bless you as you go. May Jesus be your inner strength and the overflow of your life according to his word. Amen? God bless you as you go.